And now we are going to have a panel on tech monopolies and IT giants critique of digital capitalism. We have great speakers here and I would like to ask them to come on stage. Please welcome Pat Mooney, Stefan Lange, Friederike Habermann, Katharina Beck and Frank Rieger. Thank you, Vivian. Vielen Dank, Vivian. Herzlich willkommen alle zu diesem Panel. Thank you and wel welcome to everyone to this interesting panel. We still need to provide water for everyone, and then we start. I'm Steffen Lange. I come from the Institute for Ecological Economic Research. I'm going to be the facilitator of this panel. Then we have next to me Frank Rieger, Friederike Habermann, Pat Mooney, and Katrina Beck. I'm going to introduce our panelists in more detail right now. This panel. Supposed to talk about digital capitalism. Look at an analysis of this digital capitalism. It's a big topic. What is digital capitalism all about? What kind of consequences does it have for our societies? How can we make sure that everyone can profit from it, like uh, in employment, in the ecology, questions of equality and inequality? And then, on the other hand, we'd like to focus on the tech monopolies and the digital giants. What do we do about the big corporations who uh, accumulate more and more power and profits? Before we actually give the floor to our speakers, I would like to wake you up a little bit and start with two questions. I have said we have uh, the two focuses, digital capitalism as a whole and the IT giants. I would like to ask you to take a binary decision between yes and no. My question is the following one. Do you think that digitalization will make capitalism better? Socially, socially or ecologically speaking, uh, or is it is digitalization going to make capitalism worse? So now, if you believe that digitalization will make capitalism better, then raise your hands. No questions, you just have to between to decide between yes and no. If you believe that digitalization is going to make capitalism worse, it's now your time to raise your hands. That's the majority. Uh, we are not going to have majority decisions, but we'd like to have a general idea about your mood. Who did not raise the hand at all? Okay, then you didn't understand the game. No, no, you had probably your valid reasons why you didn't want to participate. Our second focus is what do we do about the tech monopolies and IT giants? And the same simple binary question, looking into the future, question comes, do you believe the IT giants can or should be broken up? If you think Google, Google, Apple, Facebook, all of these IT giants should uh, be disintegrated. Raise your hands. If you think they should uh, remain as they are, should not be disintegrated, who, how many of you think so? Less people who did not raise the hand. Uh, again, you had your valid reasons, obviously. Thank you. I hope this uh, helped us to sort of start thinking about our topic. And we will now have a round of inputs coming from our panelists. And then we're going to have a brief panel discussion. And then you will have the opportunity to discuss, uh, first of all, amongst each other and then with the panelists. Let's start with Friederike Habermann. She sits on my left. Frederica, I've known her for a long time. And for a much longer time, she has been involved in the uh, environmental scene. I met her when she published her book uh, a couple of years ago. Recently, her new book came out, Ecomony. 
working again with each other and uh, their digitization is centerpiece and she is going to give the first inputs. Welcome her. Oh, I should have uh, written my notes in bigger letters so that I can read better. The initial question was a bit confusing. I did not participate. Uh, well, improving capitalism, what does that mean? That capitalism works in a better way or society works in a better way? And that was a tricky thing about your question, Stefan. Uh, but this issue makes the difference, the capitalism as such, will probably work better on the basis of digitalization. But whether this is true for society as well, that is exactly the issue we'd like to discuss. There were a couple of people who did not want monopolies to be disintegrated. But yesterday in our workshop, we talked about how to disintegrate Facebook. There were The room, room was crowded. It was difficult to get in. We talked about the reasons why these uh, companies should be disintegrated and how to tell the world about it and why it is a bad thing to have so many big data accumulated by Facebook and WhatsApp and all the others. When I left the workshop, I faced the uh, panel of Crypto Party they had summarized a number of the results and they said, yes, okay, the electronic uh, toothbrush does not only notice how long I brush my teeth, but uh, which products I use. And based on your morning exercise of brushing, brushing your teeth, you can draw conclusions on the individual traits of a person. Then, Alexa, if I tell Alexa to remind me of my daily tasks and then Tinder where in small print you have, of course, we will follow whatever you are going to say and share in these rather intimate chats. That is to say, there's somebody out there, uh, out there who scans your emails uh, or tracks your positions. This is what everybody is doing, both Facebook and all the others. A year ago, there was a video that uh, explained the bad story. It was a, a video made by a professor for artificial intelligence. He made a film called Slaughterbotch, a seven-minute short film. Slaughterbots. There, one could see a massacre committed at a school. And this was a drone attack committed on the schools. And after that attack, quite accidentally, all young people who are critical of the system have been hit by the drone. And you're not sure who was that, who committed that attack or maybe it was the state after all. Uh, you couldn't find out in that film. And uh, the whole drone thing uh, was, this drone attack was committed based on information and face recognition. I have learned that we are no longer talking about data protection, but protection against manipulation. If the devices that I mentioned learn to imitate voices, and make video evidence. And so you can no longer differentiate between fake news and real news. Yesterday, I was told there was a panel about such technology that should be tested to be dictatorship proof. Uh, 
Well, we have said it is possible to uh, set up a dictatorship on the basis of the data. Harald Welzer has said it several times. It is no longer possible to hide people in a basement in, uh, like in, in, in fascism. This nowadays is no longer possible. China and the social scoring example was mentioned several times. where a lot of information is collected regarding uh, what you purchase, how much you purchase, who you are friends with, and all of that. Of course, can be used. And if everything is automated, uh, then it can be a problem. That is only part of the story. I have tried to highlight the other part of the story. And here I am fo following Jane Rifkin, the uh, future researcher. He looked about the society and how the different forms of internet could be used beneficially if we l can live, if we could live in an a society of emancipation. The term commons was mentioned several times, also a very central term when it comes to reshaping the economy. My book e Commoni is based on a mix between the words economy and commons. I wanted to say something against the critics who say, well, uh, creative commons and commons uh, can we work on a small scale. It will never work uh, globally. But we have the Internet of Energy, of Logistics, the Internet of Things. So we would have the infrastructure to be networked globally and uh, to shape our economy in a totally different way without capitalism, but peer to peer. And here, I wanted to look at the potential of such an economy uh, without focusing too much on the risks, but rather exhausting the potential. Commons is not necessarily linked to technology. I, Harald Welzer yesterday said there is a link between technological development and emancipatory societies. I think that is very Eurocentristic. I don't think so. This will. Is, this is really true, but of course uh, we need to overcome scarcity. We need to overcome uh, uh, ownership and uh, collaborate uh, with one another in a totally different way compared to the capitalist economy of exchange. Do we have a choice? I work in a common space project in Brandenburg, and the expert for digital technology, Yevgeny Marozov, said we are never going to return to a society where the buses will just work without a digital connection. Well, I don't think in Brandenburg, in this area around Berlin, we already have digitally linked buses. Uh, uh, the buses either come as they used to come in the old days or they, didn't co they, they don't come at all. The question just is, what kind of society do we have? based on the technology. Last night we had uh, examples about the uh, auto autonomous driving that Harald Welzer rejects. And I thought, well, it's not too bad. So I won't be surrounded by young testosterone driven people. But Harald Welzer said this uh, technology is organized, is developed by men. So it's a completely masculine technology. And I thought, may hey, the problem is the driver, not the technology. And then we also talked about the robots used for nursing care. Would you want to be nursed by a robot? The moderator yesterday said so she could accept that. But I think, I mean, getting nursing care from a person that is so much under pressure that uh, they go home in a depressive state every evening because they've seen my sad eyes. So is that better uh, than the robot that uh, would take care of you?
These are the facts that we have in our society based on technology. Artificial intelligence now compresses this uh, discussion. Yesterday, we had an international conference where we had a working group where people from all walks of life worked together over three days. Also, people of color were involved. There we talked about artificial intelligence and uh, immediately we also talked about the sexist and racist dialogue that we have also in this context. So it all boils down to the need to change our society. It is important to look at uh, technology and a disintegration of monopolies. We need to have decentralized structures. We, there are natural monopolies, of course, and I mean, that is why we are all in Facebook and so on and so forth. But as far as infrastructure is concerned, it should not be centralized. It should be organized in a decentralized way, it should be transparent and as democratic as can be. This brings me to the end of my intervention. Yesterday I said we need to use the lo logic of commoning. And like Angelika Zahn yet said yesterday, it is not enough uh, to be efficient and have digital efficiency and sufficiency. It is also necessary to find new ways of interaction. And here we should tap the sharing opportunities, not based on a capitalist logic, but based on a different kind of logic. The logic of solidarity, for instance. At least we should try to develop a system such like this. And we also need to use our power. I mean, Hampacher Wald, uh, that was a wonderful example. The video made by one of the activists in Hambacher Wald uh, had uh, so many viewers, so many clicks. They lived in the Hambach forest during this uh, protest against lignite mining based completely on uh, solidarity. The solidarity principle was applied everywhere instead of the uh, principle of maximum performance. We have learned yesterday also in that Facebook destruction workshop about having clear-cut goals, uh, having a positive vision. And I think this is this society based on solidarity that we must establish with or without technology. And that's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Frederike. Next speaker will be Katarina Beck. Uh, she worked in several NGOs like the Oikos International and the Institute of Social Banking, and uh, she is now a consultant to employers' organizations regarding sustainability. She works with the Green Party in the Federal Working Group on Economy and Finances. Welcome, Katarina. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Actually, I was invited to speak in my capacity as a senior manager of a consulting agency. However, I've been introduced in a different way, so I'm not playing the role of the bad girl here. And Actually, the role of corporations and consulting agencies is contradictory in a turbo-capitalist society. So I'm always in favor of a um, you do both and instead of opting for the either or approach. There is one aspect I realized when I walked through the halls of the university, and it's patriarchy. Actually, I tried to find restrooms for ladies here. There are none, only for men. 
which is typical because this is a technical university. I guess a lot needs to be done in order to get the gender question right. Was ich sagen möchte, ist eher was Schönes und Positives, sowohl das erste Podium heute Morgen als auch. And, then, and that's a positive. I also realize that the panels are balanced as far as gendering is concerned. I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for having made sure that we always have women and men on stage. I might not have to tell you, but digitization is most probably the biggest transformation we've ever experienced. We might think back of the Industrial Revolution and maybe the steam engine would be a similar thing. But digitization is certainly incredible. Remember the um, World Championship in 2016? What was the most famous app at the time? Soccer, I'm talking about. There was no app. Sorry, 2006 is the year I mentioned. And actually, there was no app in 2006. In the beginning, people weren't sure whether apps would have a future at all. And today, we are doing apps each and every day. And you see apps no matter where you go. Maybe people don't have electricity in sub sahara Africa, but they do have a mobile communication network. The digital infrastructure was rolled out rapidly and a speed and a penetration into all fields and spheres of life and work is simply revolutionary, I'd say. And it's important to, therefore, become aware once again of the fact that this is a truly penetrating innovation. There are contradictions, that's true, and the whole can be positive and negative. The positive impacts have been underlined with respect to capitalism and the transformation of society, that's true. But the majority of you agreed that digitization has a negative impact and I would like to therefore briefly ponder the three pillars of sustainability and I would like to focus on the negative aspects first and foremost so that we feel inclined to think of what we can do in order to manage the transformation in a good way. The ecological pillar, you can gain efficiency by means of digitization. We have analyzed 12 applications in housing, in mobility, in agriculture. I've written several studies about sustainability and theoretically it's possible to decouple growth from increasing CO2 emissions. Right now, both go hand in hand. Economic growth means more emissions. But if you take the right measures, you can decouple the two processes. There are other positive ecological impacts, less paper used, less materials used, less pesticides, for example, by means of a more efficient planting technology. You might talk about the ethical sides, the pros and cons, but all in all, it's good what you get. But you also trigger negative impacts, like the energy consumption has increased considerably. I've seen here at the conference a picture postcard showing the data flows and showing, and that's the important bit, that the transportation of data is the third biggest energy consumer. 
I mean, if you have 100% renewable energies, that's fine, but this is not what we are having today. And then we also have to bear in mind that there are rebound effects. Often people think that if I save money here, I can spend it on something else. Now, we need to make sure that this mechanism does not apply to energy. We've carried out a study and looked at the connection between digitization and the achievement of the, the, the possibility to reach the, the SDGs. And of course, you need to consider the toxic impacts and the social impacts, and both are considerable. So we need a radical transformation. We need to end the linear economy in order to adopt a recycling economy. As far as the social sector is concerned, I like that I can communicate with so many people all over the world thanks to the digitization right now. I'm working on the Asia strategy for my company and I am closely collaborating with colleagues in Singapore and in the United States. We can just Skype and talk and that's wonderful, as wonderful as talking to my little nephew in Amsterdam. And then, of course, there is my favorite subject, that's the democratic co-determination or participation, the buzzword would be the Arab Spring here. And yet, we do have to see the negative impact. A journalist once carried out an experiment. He established a fake account and he got lots of friends' requests and then he started posting nonsense and he got a lot of support the whole day. And eventually he had to lock out because the support he got from the anti-democratic statements he put online made him kind of dependent. It's uh, filter bubbles we are talking about and they are being reinforced by the algorithms. And this, once again, strengthens the radical trends we see online anyway. So the fact that they become more powerful online is also due to the filter bubbles online, because there people say what they would not dare to say in their real lives or what they were not allowed to say in real life or are allowed to say. So we are dealing with a particular culture here and we need to be very careful in this respect. The economy, jobs, big question, and many other aspects, jobs. We carried out a meta study covering 50 studies and the results are mixed with respect to the overall result. You've certainly heard about the study that says that 48% of all jobs will be lost because of digitization. This is an irresponsible study, I say, because many blue-collar jobs will be lost, true, but there will be new jobs also because of the digital transformation. So we need to see the overall balance, which is not really changing. It's not the number of jobs which is changing. It's the quality of jobs. If you are a four-wheel driver today, you might make sure tomorrow that the automatic fork-wheel, fork lifts work well automatically. I will speak just uh, a minute longer, and I don't want others to follow, said the moderator. Now continues the speaker. Ecological business cases like sharing, for example, are opened up. 
thanks to digitization and 3D printing too. This is production based on people's needs. And this is certainly also about the modernization of the markets and lobbies, because we still have the primacy of the economy over politics, which needs to change. And we also have a deep gap or divide between the digital haves and have-nots. My wish is we need to renew the energy transformation. We need to make sure that there is no algorithmic discrimination. And I would like to have the taxation for corporations in a uniform way all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Now, we are moving from the overall and global image into the and or context. And we would like to approach very concrete examples. Frank Riga will be the next speaker. He has founded a number of startup companies, data navigation and e-reading are his speciality. He's also with the board of CCC Alternative Laws is the title of his podcast, and we are looking forward to his presentation today. Thank you. I'm not really sure whether I will give concrete examples because we think to we, we need to reflect upon the times we are living in. We are using a number of tools, and these tools decide what kind of society we will have in the future. Well, we call it digitization, but it's much more. We ran into the digitization process without having had a real social or societal substructure. We have resistance or refusal in the eco and sustainability movement. People say, I won't ever buy a smartphone, but then they do and then they like it and eventually you find them on Facebook. That's your typical career of people who refuse to go digital. So we need to ask ourselves what business models are involved here. What are the mechanisms, the algorithms? These are always an expression of human action and wanting and wishing. It's always the implementation of a goal, and the goal is profit as a rule. If you look at Facebook or Google, for example, I mean, these are not search engines or social media. These are advertising machines. The only intention they pursue is clicks. People are supposed to click. So what's the real intention? What's the intention of Google to work in the field of automatic driving? I mean, they don't want to have people look at the steering wheel anymore. Why? Americans spend, on an average, 90 minutes per day in a car. And if they don't look at Google but on the street or on the steering wheel, they don't buy. They don't see the ads sold by Google. So Google wants us to spend more time in the system so that they can offer more advertising for things we don't need anyway. The consequence, we need to ask how we can produce technology so that it serves a society instead of deteriorating a situation which is a bad one anyway. 
And technology is not like a natural force. It's always an expression of what we want, or in this case, in the case of Google and others, the expression of a business model. Thus, the conclusion with respect to a sustainable digital development is to no longer be afraid of criticizing, of no longer being afraid to go and say, these corporations are bad for our planet and we might have to destroy them or disassemble them. This is what we have to be aware of. Whether digitization can help us save the planet is a question which is a multifaceted one, and many of these aspects have been mentioned here. But we should not forget that in the current orientation, many digitization business models are models which mean that the majority of our societies, the people we tend to call the precariat, might be in a situation eventually in which they cannot deal with ecological or sustainable aspects anymore. It's already difficult for them to deal with these aspects. Look at France. These people who are wearing the gilet jaune, these are people who have low-income jobs. And Macron's policy of increasing gas prices petrol prices is threatening their lives. For them, it's getting more and more difficult to make a living. And this is an impact of digitization we see all over. Jobs are being digitized. People need to understand, first of all, how does a certain job work, for example? How do I drive my locomotive? Now, many of these jobs are getting easier for the one who has the job. But if no much, not, not, not much skill or qualification is considered, uh, is, is, is um, necessary anymore to fulfill a certain task, it's getting easier to substitute one worker for another or driving in the streets, it's getting increasingly difficult. You have lots of trucks and station wagons blocking the streets. Why? Now, people don't go to the shop anymore. They order online, which is easier for them. But then people have to bring these goods home. And these people are driving vans, and these vans block the streets. But there are alternative options, like, for example, the goods ordered by a person are being picked up by others who carry them along because they're going the same way. This would be a way to improve the quality of our environment. Right now, however, we are collecting all these data, Facebook, Google, they collect as many data as they can get, and that's the trend. And due to this trend, useful ways of using digitization doesn't happen. In Germany, for example, right now, we have smart meters, which are meant to have you use your washing machine when the sun shines by using the solar energy which has been stored in the system. However, people tend to overlook that the overall energy saving is a minor one. It's not really much you can save by just adding smart meters to your household. However, there are different ways to proceed. Like, you could have a visualization of the energy consumption on the spot, locally, in your home, for example, or in your company, you realize then that there is a certain object, machine or whatever, that needs a lot of energy. And you can then go and reduce the energy consumption of your household. This is a much better approach than putting smart meters in your basement. We need sensors. You can control. You can put 
add data, collect data you can control in order to get an idea of what is happening. I mean, look at all these people who sit in the business cla class lounges at the airports and talking about the CO2 emissions and their fine granular systems in their fancy phones. But that doesn't help me much. I'm a hacker. I'm of the CCC. And I am interested in solutions and in aspects of the problem which make a difference, which are not just empty air, sound nice, showcasing or window dressing, but would a real business models. Maybe these business cases destroy other business cases because this is about setting up collectives. This is about satisfying needs in a way which doesn't cause damage to the planet but improves the situation of the planet. It's a valid approach in dealing with digitization. Making it better is always an option we should not overlook and forget. And one? The situation is beneficial for us right now, I'd say, because the big five, the big IT corporations, have completely transformed the startup market. Because many of the business cases which could be funded right now, which would be feasible or viable today, don't get funds anymore. Venture capitalists are not willing to sponsor these octopus systems, for example, anymore because they fear that in a given moment Google will show up and just buy out the company so there is less money for the systems we don't want. But this doesn't mean that in general you don't have money for Datenkrake and similar systems. Now, if we want to have more sustainability and a more just society, if we want to make things better, we should try and find out how to benefit from these trends. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. I will hand over to our last panelist, Pat Muni. I forgot to say that Pat is going to speak in English. So those of you who don't speak English, hopefully have uh, a translation, an interpretation device. Pat has a long and interesting uh, CV. He worked for many uh, international um, NGOs, international trade and development, uh, agriculture, biodiversity, and new technologies. So digitalization is a very important topic he deals with. In 1985, he got the Right, li right Livelihood Award, and he works now in the Accenture Group of dealing with the impact of new technologies on vulnerable communities worldwide. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. Um, I would like to look at digital capitalism in the, as an example. An example will be uh, uh, the future of world food security, uh, where I think we're having an impact. On, we're seeing an impact of digital capitalism already, and who's going to control our food supply? Let's say in the year 2030. It's not not a bad year to pick. Uh, we've just gone through a round of mergers. Very uh, people in Germany are very well aware of between seed and pesticide companies. The reason for the mergers, according to all of the companies involved, was because of technologies, because the need to control digital information. At the end of the mergers, if you look at the conventional wisdom, it says that the largest seed company in the world today is now Bayer because Bayer bought Monsanto and there's other mergers as well, but Bayer came out on top. And Bayer is also the world's first or second biggest uh, pesticide company. In fact, because of digital information, there's no longer a difference between the digital management of biology and the digital management of chemistry. 
it's really the same thing. So seeds and pesticides now as two links in the food chain have come together with these mergers and today we have just four companies that control more than two thirds of the world's basic inputs into our food supply, the seeds and the pesticides. Just four companies. And when, when civil society said, gee, that's too few, we need more diversity in our food system than having four companies at the beginning of the food chain controlling everything. But the companies say, well, oh, it's four companies still, it's not just one, it's okay. And again, it's the merger for these companies of digital DNA, the ability to manipulate chromosomes, the base pairs of DNA on your computer, as it is their ability to, to manage the information about markets and weather and other transportation flows and customer preferences and so on. But it's not just there. Down the food chain, we have another company no one ever heard of before in, ag in agriculture, and that's a company called BGI. BGI used to be known as the Beijing Genomics Institute, based in China. BGI has quietly been going around the world. It doesn't sell seeds or chemicals to anybody, but it's been going around the world uh, offering gene banks, national and international gene banks, repositories of seeds, the opportunity to give BGI their seeds in return for a digital map of those seeds given back to them. In the meantime, while BGI has been doing that, it's been patenting the information they find useful in the digital maps of the seeds. So DGI has been, BGI has been trying to collect the genetic information, digital information, of more than seven and a half million plant varieties that were bred originally by farmers in 7,000 different crops, the entire world's food supply. So while it sells nothing to anybody, it may be, in fact, bigger than Bayer, far bigger than Bayer, and by far the most powerful company at the beginning of the food chain. But beyond BGI, with digital information, we have other companies. We have a company, for example, like John Deere. John Deere is the world's largest farm machinery company. Since the year 2000, John Deere has had sensors in its tractors, and it's had satellite information as well. This allowed it to both monitor everything that happens in the field as its machinery plants the crop, everything that happens in the field when its, plant, its farm machinery harvests the crop. And it's able to link that information to its knowledge of weather patterns, climate conditions, and market conditions. So at the end of the day, when we look at the beginnings of the food chain, John Deere wins because John Deere has the box with all the digitized information, and that box is the one that puts in the seeds, the pesticides, the fertilizers, and the water at the beginning of the season and harvest the crop at the end of the season. They know more than either BGI or Bayer knows because of digitized knowledge. But beyond that, we have the grain trading companies, companies like Cargill and Bungie and Dreyfus and Archer Daniels Midland, huge companies that have been handling the trade of food around the world. Those companies are panicking now because they have weather information and they have market information, but so does everybody else. In fact, they will lose out to the farm machinery companies because, because that information is also held by John Deere and John Deere holds the genomics information as well. But it goes beyond that because you go further along the chain See how digitization will affect processing companies and the food retailing companies, and the world changes again. Because if you're a processor, you're looking at basically a few basic ingredients. You need to have calories, you need to have mouthfeel, you need to have sweetness, you need to have a few sort of aspects of the not, and you don't actually need to have nutrition, by the way, just sort of mouthfeel and calories and so on. And they look at that and they say, well, these commodities can all be changed now with digital DNA. We can actually look at metabolic pathways for all of our major food ingredients. And with digital digitization of that, of that information, we are able to adjust those metabolic pathways so that we can compete with the field and we can brew our food and our beverages in vats instead, in, in, in factories, not in the field. And now we see more than 250 different food ingredients being developed through digital controls and use of metabolic pathways 
to take them out of the field and produce them again in factories, from vanilla to stevia, and it goes on and on, small crops initially, initially and bigger and bigger crops as time goes on. So a feeling then that, well, we don't actually need farming as such. We can move beyond that. Then we have the retailers. And the retailers at the end of the food chain are saying, well, we can see all the rest of this is happening in the digitization of all of that knowledge, but we are the ones that are closest to the customer. We have more market knowledge. We have to dictate what exactly it is we're going to give to the consumers. And again, their control of the information means that for the first time, the retailers and some of the processors like Nestle's and Coca-Cola and Pepsi and so on as well, are actually moving down the food chain, going directly to manage the production processes, whether it's in the factory or in the field. And they're linking their blockchains and their algorithms so they can trace everything from the field right to the, to the grocery store and to your home. So they control more knowledge at the end of the day than anyone else along the food chain. But beyond that, there's another set of companies. And that set of companies are companies like Amazon that moved in and purchased food retailing companies. First, Whole Foods, the largest organic foods company in the United States, retailer, but now into China, they're also into New Zealand, and we don't know where else they're moving. They're not just trying to to send you food on the internet, they're actually buying the shops, the stores, the grocery stores for the food. But they're also looking at, again, where that food comes from. How do they provide their digital knowledge to manipulate more of the food system? We have companies like Microsoft, who is now a plant breeding company working with Carlsberg, the brewery in Denmark. And Microsoft has found out that it's able to manipulate information about DNA in such a way that it can help to change the hops and change the yeasts and change the actual production of, uh, and, and uh, varieties of barley and wheat and crops like that. So suddenly Microsoft is a plant breeding company that may someday compete with Bayer. We have Google. Google is now working with Alibaba in China advising Chinese farmers on how to increase the yield of pigs, of, of swine, and giving direct advice to small producers. We have Facebook, now working with BASF here in Germany, advising, uh, using their, their face recognition technologies to identify crop pests and diseases in fields in my country, Canada. So Facebook is suddenly a player in the food system. Two minutes. So across, so the question then for us, as we look at these changes in the system, who in the end will be feeding us in the year 2030? What will they be giving us? What we have is a group of companies, a smaller and smaller group of companies with more and more information, who when the controllers and the world, the people concerned about competition policy say, well, we can't have this, we only have the big five suddenly in charge of our food supply. And the companies say, well, that's all right, it's five after all. As they now say, well, it's all right, it's better than the four that control seeds and pesticides today. But the control is enormous, the control is might be much greater. And in that control, at the end of the day, that's what we have to eat. That's what's left when we try to adjust to climate change. And if we don't have more control of our food supply than that, if that digital information, the digital DNA, and the marketing and weather information are controlled by those companies, then our hope for the future in feeding our children is very low. It's Sunday. Uh, I'm not a religious person. But I know this, the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is not a prayer to Amazon, or to Facebook, or to Google, or to Alibaba. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Before I hand over to our audience, I would like to have a brief round of responses of our panelists. Well, probably you all thought it was interesting, uh, or maybe you had a different opinion as well. You have heard all your peers, all your other panelists, uh, 
maybe you respond to what the others have said. Uh, what to do? That's an important thing now we haven't addressed yet. So we had a lot of analysis. But what are we going to do with, about the IT giants and how are we going to make digital capitalism a utopia instead of a dystopia? Who would like to start? There were two things that came to my mind regarding John Deere. We as hackers have always been in a war with those who control digital information and those who would like to use copyright for all and everything. And so recently we've been dealing a lot with people who are dealing with agricultural equipment and the right to repair, for instance, and how can we make it mandatory for manufacturers to make their equipment transparent so that they are not the only ones gathering uh, information. I mean, we as hackers, of course, we would like to be in a position to have technology under our control. On the other hand, we need have the need for sustainable economy and a sustainable use of our resources. And we do not want to leave that to the discretion of companies how long we are going to use our equipment and our resources before we have to buy something completely new. So the environmental movement also deals with uh, questions of copyrights because copyright oftentimes is an impediment to sustainable agriculture and the long use of equipment. That would be the most efficient uh, way to use our resources. But I think we need to sort of be more active because uh, we as hackers here are on the side of the environmentalists and uh, the, we should be aware of each other and work together. There is somebody who had a question. Friederike wanted to take the floor first. I'd like to come back to what was just said. Sustainable economy, that all sounds so nice, but uh, what does it mean? It also means we should have the right to repair. That means we will have less growth in our society. And this is not at all in line with capitalist structures. It's a, a contradiction, and we have to be aware of that. Otherwise, we will have the rebound effects, and uh, we will have no result whatsoever. So therefore, it is important for us to live according to a different logic, a, an attractive logic. Uh, well, uh, usually there are people who didn't want to have technology, but then finally they end up with Facebook. I'm not at Facebook. So how are we going to make our own office attractive? That is the most important thing. In order to bring in more people into our system. And we have to develop alternative uh, structures in agriculture, like solidarity-based agriculture that has uh, not nothing to do with capitalism, but uh, focuses on sharing. Uh, my new book says uh, we should start sharing and changing the economic roots of our system. Yesterday, we had the commons game that we played. Ulrike Helfrich uh, brought this game. And uh, when I wrote this book, I noticed monopoly is not capitalism, is an exchange log logic. And we have to be aware of these structures and understand how we want to change the way we live with each other. I heard right to repair, building up alternatives. What else do you want to mention? I would like to respond to all the statements that we have heard. You, Frederica, talked about the Facebook destruction workshop yesterday, how 
many of you have posted on Facebook that you have attended a Facebook destruction workshop. And I always thought Bayer is an awful company, but still I eat an aspirin when I have a headache. So these are the contradictions that I am interested. That's again a very philosophical question. What can we do? Well, of course, I can say we need uh, an equitable tax base, base that and uh, the dig digital com companies will have to pay taxes too. We need a strengthening of institutions in order to regain control over capitalism. But what we can do is also something to do with what we can do individually. Here we can find our intervention uh, modus, live an alternative life, set up alternative social media and uh, be politically active. But still we have all these uh, little contradictions that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Developing empathy is important. And you talked about the philosophical question and how you reported about uh, the doings of the large corporations. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we live together in a different way and still enjoy a great life? And here I think uh, we should have empathy and respect and first carry out a transformation on the individual level and at the same time we should tackle the systemic level instead of uh, accusing one another of being on Facebook or whatever. We should rather try to accept a different way of living and working with each other in spite of the technology that we are all using. And that I think is a very important prerequisite, prerequisite for us to make progress. Uh, as I said, we have alternatives. We have the individual and the systemic level part. I um, I, I'm very glad to know that there's work being done on the right to repair, and I understand that's happening. It's important. Uh, it's wider, though, than just, of course, the right to repair. It's the right to control the information. Does the farmer control the information or the retailer or who, who has that control? Um, in the end, John Deere's goal is probably to, to um, in fact, control crop insurance because they have more information than anybody else, then they're the ones that determine uh, what the insurance price should be, and then they can dictate exactly what products the farmer will use in order to get the best crop insurance. So it, it's, it goes just far beyond that, I think. But it's also a question, I think, of, of the... Uh, uh, I've had two more minutes. I would have actually gone on to say there's another layer of companies. It's not just those five, and I think it's wrong for us to fixate on the five, and I, I'm guilty of that as well. There's another layer of companies like BlackRock, um, Vanguard, State Street, uh, Blackstone, own, companies that most people have never heard of that are asset management companies. And in the case of the last mergers, uh, when you look at control of data, BlackRock was actually investing in all at its shares in all of the companies that were about to be merged. So it was able to, it's like being at a poker game where one of the poker players can walk around and look at all everybody else's cards. And they had that knowledge. So they can d dictate who's going to merge and under what conditions and who's going to be a winner. And their control of that data of investment is vastly higher than any of the other companies I've mentioned. And now they're the biggest players in agriculture. So we can't assume we know who the bad guys are yet. And it goes back to, when we talk about BlackRock and Blackstone, we're really talking about the fundamentals of capitalism. It doesn't get paved over easily. It's not a simple thing. We don't need just Disneyland theme parks of interesting tricks or interesting little vignettes of something that's kind of useful that's been done. It's a more fundamental challenge of the capitalist system. But can I maybe ask you then specifically what would your, what to do? What's your approach to tackle these different layers of uh, concentration within companies? Well, ultimately, I think we need two things. Uh, we need to have citizen-based technology assessment. 
It has to be grounded in our societies, in our social movements. It can't be tied to a single technology, not to digital information, not to biological information, not to pharmaceuticals. It's got to be citizen-based capacity to assess technologies, because our governments can't do that now. Then we need to build that in from the citizen base. We need to build that into national governments having serious technology assessment capacity. Then we need to build it up even to the United Nations level. Back in the 1990s, the United Nations had a capacity to assess technologies. It was cut off right at the beginning of the internet and the so-called knowledge economy. The UN was given a frontal lobotomy by the companies, saying we don't want to have anyone monitoring our technologies. That's got to be changed. Secondly, we also have to have competition policy. We need to radically change competition policy uh, in national governments, at the European level, and again at the United Nations level. And those two things, I think, will get us in the, in the place where we have a chance of controlling technology. If we simply take each technology one at a time and try to win these battles, we will obviously lose because we don't know whether it's going to be BlackRock or BGI or, or, uh, or uh, Bayer that's going to control it at the end of the day. Vielen Dank. Um, so, ich glaube, wir haben jetzt von allen zumindest... I think we have heard a number of ideas from everyone. Ideas, what to do about the situation as we have it. Now you can relax because I would like to give you an opportunity to be active. That is to say, please all look to your right and to your left, smile at your neighbour. Look at whether you know your neighbour or not. I will give you now five minutes to have an internal discussion with your neighbour to focus on the things that you have understood, uh, the new things you've learned, um, the uh, main message that you take home about what to do. And please, as I said, five minutes for your internal discussion in the audience and then afterwards we are going to have a Q&A to our panelists. Have fun.
soll ich denen sagen, dass du zu den Seiten kommst? Nee, nee, ich kann nicht verhalten. Ich kann nicht verhalten. Thank you. This has been what we expected it to be, and I would like to ask you now to calm down again. Great. I think a lot of exciting questions and ideas have been mentioned, and I would like to suggest that the floor is yours now. By the way, be brief and give us your names. And if you want to have an answer from a certain person, please tell us who should answer your question. Yeah, vielen Dank. Erstmal, ich bin Tom Kopp von der Uni Göttingen. Thank you, Tom Kopp, University of Göttingen. Thank you for your interesting inputs and impulses. Now, we would like to ask Frank. Now, in the beginning, when we had the poll, I raised my hand twice. I said, I want to destroy the big corporations, and then I said, I don't want to. But we do have to differentiate, of course. And it's certainly going to be difficult to distribute or to, to split the monopolies. I mean, you wouldn't want to go and say, OK, Google can run its service for a certain number of requests during the day, and then they have to switch it, them off. Doesn't make sense. The question is? Now, the destruction or the splitting up of the corporations doesn't make much sense. It's maybe more useful to overcome these business cases, like making all data of all users transparent and visible. But this might be a privacy problem. Well, to make all these data visible and transparent might probably mean the end of our society because we all need a bit of scope as far as the privacy or secrecy of our data is concerned. Now, as far as the question in general is concerned, we need to consider the different dimensions that there are, like, for example, the power of manipulation. Facebook has an enormous power of manipulation, apparently. So we suggest federations, i.e. We look at what happened to AT&T in the US, a huge corporation which was split up and the technology is still available, but it belongs to a number of small enterprises. But there are also other possibilities like Mastodon. You have a number of principles and ideas, and yet the users can use the technology. You could also have like time limits, 10 minutes per server. Otherwise, your manipulation power will be too big. So I think the federation system could be an option. 
As far as the corporations as such is concerned, well, I think we need to have a mix regulation on the one hand, uh, targeting certain business cases in order to avoid the concentration of power. Right, thank you for the question. Gute Schimpf, ich arbeite mit dem Umweltdachverband Friends of Europe. Meine erste Frage. Friends of Europe, Ute Schimpf. Frank, my question is for you. You said concrete things which have an impact or which have an effect and which make a difference. We do have a number of movements, like the food movement and others. Now, it's inspiring to hear that we need lots of movements, but how do we get things together? How can we capacitate local groups in order to exercise the political players we need? Especially that you also mentioned the role of investors. Um, one thing that I personally really struggle with is the fact that now the agrochemical giants like Bayer, BSF, Syngenta, however they're called, if I look on their problem assessment for the global problems, I'm really puzzled that actually their problem definition is so similar to ours. They say climate change, food safety, diverse consumers' demands, all of this. And it's very hard if you say digitalization or modern technologies should be used to deliver solutions for real problems. If they claim our language, our terms, our successes for the movement. And I would be interested to hear something from you too. Um, okay, I mach's kurz. Uh, I know One method to bring the movements together is a congress like this one. The hacker movement is involved in this congress, the hacker movement, and this is meant to be a signal. It's meant to show that we are interested from 27 to 30th December, we'll have our Congress, our annual Congress in Leipzig. Tickets are still available, but you can also follow the streams. We try to bring these movements to the front because we see that there are potential alliances between the different movements. And we are quite optimistic. Of course, there are always frictions and cultural differences between different movements, and they won't disappear, but we'll have to agree that there are moments in which we simply disagree. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. I mean, it's it's um, uh, the companies uh, are saying what we say, and they're saying that they need to become bigger and have more freedom of, of operation in order to provide us with the technologies we need to have food on the table in 2050. So they are making that case passionately, that they are aware of climate change, they see the problems of dietary demands for meat and dairy products especially, and they're trying to resolve that, but they, you, then they need to be given the freedom to operate. But we have to look at both the history of the companies and, in fact, what they are doing even now. Today, if you look at the, all of the agricultural input companies, 45% of their research globally is in one single crop corn or maize. That's it. So their, their, their answer to climate change in feeding us is more corn. I mean, popcorn? It just, it's, it's absurd. It, it's, uh, the, the, so that they don't have the, the, the movement. Uh, the companies to collectively together, in fact, only work with about 12 major crops in total. They do some other ornamentals, but mainly 12 crops. They produced about 100,000 patented plant varieties since the 1960s. During that same time period, peasant agriculture has worked with 7,000 crops, not 12, and they've produced 2.1 million unique plant varieties. So if we're gonna survive climate change, 
then the, the goal, I think, is to work with peasant production around the world that already feeds 70% of the world's people and c create the market environment, and the political environment, that allows them to do their job better and gives them access to what they need in terms of uh, breeding material and research to do their job better. It's not to go to companies who have narrowed down our food system to almost nothing and, they think, it, and think that innovation is simply another algorithm. Da ich ja jeden Tag mit diesen großen Firmen und vor allen Dingen I'm dealing with those companies each and every day also, as far as sustainability is concerned. Thus, I'd like to comment on the second question too. Now, from the outside, it seems as if whatever they do is evil. They are spin doctors. And this is maybe true, like when Deutsche Bank, when they rebuilt their building 10 years ago, which was to be an eco building, said sustainability gets a new home. Now, there are people who try to push sustainability forward in the big corporations of the world. And there are people who are convinced that you need big corporations in order to feed the world also in the long run. Now, empowerment by language has been mentioned. I, I, I simply assume that we agree But, of course, the big players in the world know that the productivity of permaculture is an enormous one. And this is not about sustainability and the Deutsche Bank or Lidl or whatever. I mean, they all pretend to be green, but the world doesn't become a greener one. So we need to differentiate. in order to show what these arguments are about in deed. But then we cannot go and blame the corporations as such because there are also people in those companies who try to make things better. We need more money to, in order to do this. But there are those who try to reconquer the truth for us. Well, most probably there are more questions than there is time to answer. So I'd like to suggest that there are two more questions now. Brief ones, please, and then brief answers. I will try and be brief. Emmanuel is my name. And I do see two problems. The corporations are big and they are getting bigger. And this might mean that in 50 more years, maybe two big corporations will be left and they will share the world market and both have a name that begins with the letter A. Now, would it be a strategy to go and say, let's decentralize top-down by looking at a leadership in all corporations, the big ones, that is, instead of splitting them and having many small ones. Now, I'm representing Oxfam, and I am also very interested in monopolies and the power of corporations. We set up an initiative which is about limiting the power of corporations 
because we would like to do something about the increasing concentration of the enterprises of the world or the big corporations of the world. Now, people also said we should split up these companies, but there is no law in Germany which in Germany which would allow for such a destruction. I.e., we need the law, first of all. But I'd also like to know from the panelists which other regulatory possibilities there are beyond the antitrust regulations in order to do something about the power of corporations. Now, let's have a very brief speed round up here. This is about limiting size and antitrust regulation. You don't have to answer all of you, but you might raise one aspect you'd like to remind the audience of. I don't want to comment on the laws we might need because we need to bear in mind that we are called upon to do something about the danger of having only two corporations left in the world in a hundred years. I'm also a historian and I do see that the world has changed considerably. And often you think you cannot change a thing, but if you look at history, you find out that a lot can be changed indeed. And it's always changed from the bottom. In the break, we also talked about how to generate change. The Green Party was uh, set up when I was 12 years old, and I thought, once I'm grown up, I will be a member of parliament. Meantime, I see that you are involved in many constraints. So the new movements in the world or the new approaches in the world are brought about by the new movements and the movements fighting for food sovereignty and other goals are quite similar to other movements. There's also an initiative called Big World in Movement, which includes 40 initiatives, and it's focused on needs, and needs are the opposite of a performance orientation. When Frank said only the best ones get the jobs, this is once again an example to show that there is a densification of the performance principle. We have to have very close looks, and I'm repeating myself here. But this is also about the logic of bartering. Da müssen wir ansetzen, und die gute Nachricht ist, wir können überall ansetzen, und wir können jederzeit. The good news is we can do it anywhere, everywhere, and any time. Wer möchte als nächstes? Dann Frank. Also nur ein Gedanke. Ähm, ein großer Vorteil der so großer natürlicher Monopole. Monopolies. Like Amazon. I mean, the benefit or the advantage is if you only have few of them, you have to expropriate less. Yeah, that's the way it's going to be simple. Oh. I'm going to break this technology for sure. Um, I, I think we need to do several things at once. Um, and Natur, my colleague from Oxfam uh, here in Germany, which is doing, I think, really excellent work in challenging these issues. Um, one of them is, is we need to strengthen the positive side. We need to be supporting solidarity agriculture. Uh, solidarity food systems, and we also need to be supporting agroecology. 
um, uh, at the community level, national level, and globally. And the other side need to be challenging the multinationals and challenging the, the, the companies that control the multinationals. Those two things have to go together. It's not one or the other, it's the, it's the two of them. And there are, many, there are many other channels that can be used. You can talk about intellectual property law and how that can be changed and so on, beyond competition law and technology assessment, but they all go there together. It's, uh, to me, it, 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 we need to get past where we've been, looking at short-term campaigns, two and three-year campaigns. We need to, we talk about having a slow food movement, we need to have a long food movement. A food movement that can look 10, 20, 25 years ahead and say, here's tactically, politically where we need to be. We can't do it in five years, we can't do it in 10 years, but we can change those structures over a 15 or 20 year timeline. If we don't have that long food movement, we will never be successful. Wie können wir global Alibaba und Amazon oder Apple, also auf jeden Fall die äh, zerschlagen? Das Problem ist, dass wir. How can we? We is the problem. Because we're dealing with global corporations and these are not global governments. So I agree to Ulrike. We, that's always difficult in spite of the fact that I love to think the global we, but there are laws and regulations which erode our initiatives. What can be done in addition to anti-trust laws, corporate tax, corporation tax, close the tax havens, have more rights for whistleblowers, or better rights for whistleblowers, protect them better. I'm also in favor of the regulatory footprint. Transparency is what I would like to see here. And commissions, expert commissions should also invite representatives of the opposition and these are but some examples of what we could do or ask for thank you it's impossible to summarize a panel i will try nevertheless build alternatives that was the proposal of the movements, reforms or radical reforms on different levels were suggested as well, and a focus on the concentration of corporations on different levels, and this is what we need to tackle as well, up to the point at which there is only one Amazon left which we can dismantle. Thank you very much for listening, and enjoy your lunch break. Podium.